Hey everyone, are we there? So I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty. So I'm not sure if this is working. Oh, hopefully it is, hopefully it is. So I think we are on um, and let's do this. So a little bit of technical difficulties. I'll figure this out eventually. So I'm really, really excited for everybody to be here. And tonight we're going to be talking about cat lymphoma. So I'm going to wait a few minutes while everybody jumps on and uh, hopefully we will get this going. So give me a couple of secs, everyone hop on. For some reason I'm not getting the window with all of my comments from you guys. Um, so I do see that there are definitely people hopping on and that is great. Um, but like I said, I'm not seeing the comment section. So that is going to be a problem because I need to get your guys questions. So bear with me as we try to get this working. Um, let's see. Annoying technology. It's great when it works and frustrating when it does not. So um, if you're there, I would love to be able to see. You know what, guys? I think we might have to end this and then restart it because I'm not getting the comment section and we definitely need for me to be able to answer your questions. So... Let me see, Caitlin, want to send me a message? Um, okay, so Caitlin is going to text me the comments, so we're just going to try that and see if it works. So uh, let's go for it, guys, because I really appreciate everybody hopping on. It's late in New York, um, 9 o'clock on the East Coast, 6 o'clock on the West Coast. I uh, had a little bit of a crazy day, and that is because Matilda, my 8-year-old Labrador, had major knee surgery in Rhode Island. So I went up to Ocean State Veterinary Specialist yesterday. We left at like six in the morning. She had her surgery that day with the amazing team there, Dr. Chris Ralphs, who I went to vet school with. Um, and so then we drove home today and she's on a lot of pain meds and resting comfortably. And it's just been a little bit of a stressful day. So a uh, couple of things, just want to remind everybody that our next live question and answer session will be on March 13th. I think we're doing that one during the day. Uh, just remember if you go on the event section on our Facebook page um, and click on there and then say if you're interested, you'll also get reminders. So that's really helpful. Um, and the topics to be announced. So I was thinking we'll do a poll, um, but I'm really curious to see what you guys are interested in um, and so we can get some topics picked. I was thinking, I'm gonna try to get this set up on my other one. Um, I was thinking that we might do bone cancer, uh, we could do splenic cancer, um, but I would love in the comments if you guys want to put, um, you know, what topics you might be interested in. So I'm going to try to see if on my other device, there we go, we can try to get the comments going. Um, so Jenny's here and Caitlin's here and uh, Linda's here. So thanks guys. Um, again, a little bit weird that I can't see the comments, but I do have a couple of questions that we're gonna get started with. Um, and then hopefully um, Caitlin can remind us um, or fill me in on some of the other questions as they come through. Okay, so first question that I have Oh, one thing is, even though I'm not seeing the comments, I would love for you, uh, why don't you throw your name in the comments and let me know where you're from. That would be great. Um, also, maybe if you have a cat that was affected with lymphoma, you can put your kitty's name and tell me what kind of lymphoma, and that will help me kind of, you know, focus this on what you guys are interested in, what questions that you may have. So, um, like I said, go ahead, put your name in the comments. Um where you're from, and then again, your kitty's name and what type of cancer he or she may have had. And then we can um, hopefully answer the questions there. So let's see, Caitlin, you're gonna help me out here. All right, and so Caitlin is my social media guru and really good friend, and she's gonna helpfully help me with this. And we're gonna get going. Okay, so first question that we have, um, and this was a question from Angel, and she wanted to know the difference between lymphoma, lymphosarcoma, and leukemia. And so that is a great question. 
Um, and the, you know, lymphoma and lymphosarcoma are actually the exact same thing. They're just different terminology, um, for the same cancer. And you will hear people use them interchangeably. Most people will usually call it lymphoma, but again, if you hear lympho and lymphosarcoma, it's exactly the same thing. So that is good to know. Leukemia, so all of these cancers, lymphoma and leukemia, are cancers of one of the white blood cells called the lymphocyte, which is part of our immune system cells. Le leukemia, by definition, is a cancer that originates in the bone marrow. Um, and so we see acute leukemias in dogs and leukemias in cats as well, though it's probably a little bit more common in dogs. So it's a cancer of the same cell, but in leukemia, it's going to originate in the bone marrow. And what happens is as those cells end up in the bloodstream, you'll have very high lymphocyte counts. There's an acute and chronic form. The acute one is going to be more sudden. The kitties get uh, sick more suddenly. And then there can be a chronic one where you're going in and your vet is noticing slowly and incrementally that the lymphocyte count is being elevated. As those cells are infiltrating the bone marrow, they're kind of squeezing out all the other cells that we make in the bone marrow. So your cat may have low red blood cells, low white blood cells, and or low platelets. And they can have one of those cell lines be low or all of them. And so, um, it, you know, before, I, I would say before the 1980s, we used to see a lot of FELV positive lymphoma, which tended to cause leukemia and tended to be in the bone marrow tends to be in younger kitties. Um, uh, there's a predilection for male kitties, usually outdoor kitties. And we've done a great job in the last, you know, 10, 20 years um, in you know, decreasing FELV. Cattery shelters have done a great job with screening and testing. So we don't see as much FELV positive um, lymphomas. And that's good. Why? Because that tends to be a negative predictor for cats. What do I mean by that? Those kitties don't do as well. And so that is um, their prognosis. They can respond, but they don't have the same long remissions that we see in some of the cats with um, lymphoma um, or FELV negative leukemia. So definitely uh, lymphoma is going to be better than that. <clears throat> Okay, so that is the first question. The second question has to do with staging. And so I'm just going to take a moment and check for our comments from Caitlin. Um, and then hopefully, if it's not specific to the topic right now, I will come back to it. So Marcia says, how would you treat a cat with intestinal biopsy when it comes back suspect lymphoma? So that's great. So let's talk about the testing that we can do for lymphoma. So... Um, that is called staging. It's a funny word. I didn't make it up, but when your veterinarian is talk about or your oncologist is talk about doing staging tests, they're usually doing tests to either make the diagnosis or see how widespread the lymphoma is. And so, and it's different in dogs and cats, the staging that we do. So usually let's talk about the different forms of lymphoma because that will also dictate what kind of testing that you're doing. So as Marsha is asking questions about um, the most common form of lymphoma that we see in kitties involves a gastrointestinal tract, which is totally different than dogs, which we discussed last month. Dogs, only about 5 to 7% of lymphomas involve the <clears throat> intestinal tract. In cats, that's the most common form. And the symptoms um, are usually vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, and decreased appetite. And your cat can have one of those or your cat can have all of those if they have gastrointestinal lymphoma. And so sometimes the only symptom, and it can be really shocking to pet owners, is weight loss. So again, that's why it's really important that we get our cats to the vet regularly and also weigh our cats possibly at home, you know, with us or have a scale for them. Because I can, I'll be honest, you know, my cat, when he was sick from kidney disease, lost a lot of weight. And when we're with our pets every day, it's really, really hard to be able to you know, see how much weight they're losing. And sometimes it takes someone visiting, like a mother-in-law, to notice how much weight loss, you know, a pet is having. So again, vomiting, diarrhea, decreased appetite, and weight loss are going to be the symptoms for um, lymphoma in kitties. So then we have to separate lymphoma in the GI tract into two categories. And you will hear them called um, large cell or high grade, which is a more aggressive form, and then low grade or small cell. And they're really different in how your cat's going to potentially get sick. 
The high grade one, the cats usually when they go into the vet after the symptoms that we talked about, your vet is possibly going to palpate a mass. So they're going to feel a mass in the belly and that's usually a mass in the GI tract itself or big lymph nodes. These cats are getting with a high grade form, the large cell form, are getting sicker much more quickly. And so um, this is not something that's going on over a period of six months. It's usually something that's going on within days to weeks. And you really, you know, if your cat is very sick, you really need to get them in because this is one that we want to start treatment very quickly. Okay, on the other end of the spectrum is the low grade or small cell GI lymphoma. Those kitties tend to have more of a chronic history, usually over a period of three to six months. Same thing, vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, poor appetite. But when you go in, your vet may feel some lymph nodes, but they're usually not as big as they are with a high grade. And so if your cat's having any of these symptoms that are going on, you know, over a period of a month, you really want to do the next step, which is an abdominal ultrasound. So that's going to be our first staging test. And again, you're looking, you know, at the GI tract, the lymph nodes in the abdomen, the liver, the spleen, those are other organs that are commonly um, involved with lymphoma. High-grade lymphoma is way easier for us to diagnose. Usually we can aspirate or stick a needle into the cat's GI mass or the big lymph node, and cytology is usually going to give us a quick answer in one or two days. So those tend to be the easier ones to make a diagnosis. Cats with low-grade lymphoma look very similar to inflammatory bowel disease, which is a non-cancer, um, but those kitties, usually the, uh, if you can aspirate something, if the lymph nodes are big enough, cytology is usually not rewarding, meaning not going to give us an answer, and we usually have to go and get GI biopsies. And then sometimes, to go back to Marsha's question, um, you know, if the... just. So if you have a suspect based on intestinal biopsies, sometimes they can add on a test at the lab called PAR, which is an advanced diagnostic, and that can confirm lymphoma. The other thing is usually, and you'll get some different, different opinions from different oncologists and GI internal specialists, I usually prefer that these guys get something called full thickness biopsies, which is going to be done either via abdominal surgery or laparoscopy where they go in with some ports, um, with some instruments and they, without making a full abdominal incision, but they can collect full thickness biopsies. So all the different layers of the GI tract. If you do an upper GI scoping, um, you're only getting partial thickness and sometimes you're not gonna be able to get an answer with that. Um, so again, I usually prefer full thickness biopsies and that's what we ended up doing with my kitty Jeter a bunch of years ago. Um, and he was originally diagnosed with IBD. If I get IBD results on not full thickness biopsies, I'm usually suspicious that we missed it. And that's really important to know because a cat can have IBD right next door to lymphoma. So if you grab the wrong piece or you don't get full thickness, you may think your cat has IBD when they actually have low grade lymphoma. So again, abdominal ultrasound is gonna be one of the most important tests that we're gonna be doing for our cats with lymphoma. Some of the other staging tests that we're going to do, we always want to do full blood work and a urinalysis um, as, you know, part of general health screening. And it's weird, like, the, not weird, but it's surprising to a lot of owners that you can completely have um, normal blood work and a very sick kitty who's losing weight and things like that. So sometimes we'll see some abnormalities on blood work and sometimes we won't. Um, chest x-rays are ideal, but not the most important test in cats with lymphoma. So, you know, you want to talk to your oncologist or your, you know, um, your doctor to find out if ultra, if chest x-rays are going to be something, but definitely blood work and a urinalysis and definitely that abdominal ultrasound and then the aspirates or some sort of biopsy to confirm what's going on. So those are sort of the most important staging tests. Another really important test for cats with GI lymphoma, either high grade or low grade, is something called a mal digestion profile. And we know that a lot of cats have inadequate B12 levels when they have GI disease. This can be with inflammatory bowel disease as well. And so um, that's something that um, we can supplement and that will really help with the weight gain and getting everything back to normal for these kitties. So we definitely want to think about doing that maldigestion profile as well. Um, Caitlin, how am I doing on questions? Um, I'm completely annoyed that I can't see them, but we will we will go on. Um, the other um, the other thing to think about with lymphoma is not every cat has GI lymphoma, and so there are definitely some other forms out there. So the I know this sounds weird. The best type of lymphoma. Um, 
that um, we see in cats is actually in the nose, so nasal lymphoma. And those kitties actually have a better prognosis and longer survival times than cats with the GI lymphoma and some of the other forms. Um, we can see lymphoma in the skin in cats uncommonly. Uh, it can involve the kidneys, it can involve the spinal cord and the central nervous system, um, and it can involve the liver as well. And usually in cats, instead of uh, a staging system as we do in dogs, we usually just describe their lymphoma by anatomic location. It's also a form that we see in the chest called mediastinal lymphoma. Those kitties, you're definitely going to do chest x-rays because they often have fluid around their lungs, difficulty breathing, and they have a big, big lymph node in front of their heart um, that can cause difficulty breathing. Those kitties usually are, are feline leukemia positive, as we were talking about. Um, so we don't see a lot of that anymore, um, but those would be kitties that I would not skip the chest x-rays on. Um, and statistically, those cats don't do as well. And one thing I think that's always super important with statistics, guys, is that um, to remember that your cat will not be a statistic. And sometimes they do worse and sometimes they do better. But one of the kitties, one of my famous kitties, to me anyway, that I treated named Jojo, had that mediastinal lymphoma, fluid around the lungs. We were pulling the fluid off, starting chemotherapy. And I told the owners that he probably wouldn't get through the six months of chemotherapy because they usually relapse and they're usually tougher to treat. He went into remission, finished his chemo, relapsed in his abdomen, like a classic kitty, about two and a half years later, we repeated his chemo again. Jojo went back into remission and he's still alive seven years later. And his family loves to remind me how wrong I was. And I am always happy to be wrong like that when it means that our patients are living longer and beating the statistics. So I'm all about statistics busters and I love them. Um, so, um, so that is always great. So I'm just checking my messages from Caitlin. So again, you know, just because your cat may have one of the forms that doesn't traditionally do well doesn't mean that it's not worth treating in your kitty. Um, I'm going to try to do one other thing to see if we can get back on. Okay, let's try this. Ooh, I think Caitlin might have figured this out for me. Um, Nope, that doesn't work, honey. <laughs> um, can't get off that window. She's trying to get me back on so I can see everybody's comments. Um, but for some reason, it does not want to work. So let me go back to the page. Sorry, guys. Bear with me. I don't think that's working. Here we go. Up. Oh, I think that worked, Caitlin. Yay. I think that's good. All right, guys. Oh my goodness. Caitlin, thank you. You're the best. Um, so she is, she figured it out for me. So clearly I can't do this alone. So, um, all right. I am just going to kind of scroll through and see, um, what kind of comments we have. So, um, Hi, Marilyn. So your seven-year-old kitty, Sierra, was diagnosed with lymphoma, the masses in her neck. So that's great. Thank you. I forgot to bring up that one. So in dogs, the most common form of lymphoma we see is like people with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So they are going to be in the neck. So uh, under the jaw, um, in front of the shoulders, and behind the knee. Um, and so that's called peripheral lymph node lymphoma. And that is one of the less common forms in kitties. So dogs and cats are definitely not the same in this one. Um, and so that is um, one of the less common forms. It can be a little bit tougher to treat in some of those kitties. So last week she had Depromedrol, which is a steroid, um, and then sneezing and the mass is growing. So any advice? So it sounds like, uh, Marilyn, that you're not treating um, with, chemo. And so, you know, Depomedrol is a type of steroid. It's not my favorite because it's a long acting one. And if you need to stop or taper, it's kind of stuck in the cat for a month. So I usually prefer oral prednisolone in kitties, um, not prednisolone, uh, prednisolone, sorry, not prednisone, prednisolone. And that's because some kitties can't convert prednisone to prednisolone. Um, but definitely if they're not responding, you know, if Usually cats do much better with chemotherapy. We didn't get up to treatment, um, but obviously um, 
you know, they're going to do better if you can add chemotherapy uh, to the protocol and not just steroids. So steroids is a good alternative if you decide against chemotherapy. Usually, so we can talk a little bit about treatment, um, but usually cats that are not treated for lymphoma, it can be pretty aggressive and that for the high grade, and that's why you want to get them in as soon as possible. Um, but usually... Um, those kitties, the survival times are only about um, a month. So really, really short. Uh, with steroids, you usually see about two to three months, depending on um, how aggressive it is in that specific kitty. Um, so you can double the time, and they can often get their appetite back and get them into a partial response, but it's not going to usually last very long. Um, the best thing, just as in dogs, a treatment of choice for cats with lymphoma is, for most of the forms, uh, we'll come back to nasal, is chemotherapy. And so this is where, like, everybody please listen up because, you know, chemotherapy in dogs and cats is much better than people. But what surprised me when I was an intern and actually really getting interested in, in treating dogs and cats with cancer is how well cats handle chemo. And they have less side effects than, than dogs, which is pretty amazing in dogs and cats do better than people. So that's pretty exciting um, that they can do so well. Um, let me just get the comments back up and um, have very little side effects. So the way that it typically works with a cat. So again, cats and dogs are a little bit different. Cats or sorry, dogs, you know, with a good chemotherapy protocol, we have 80 to 90% plus will go into complete remission. It's pretty predictable for the average dog that goes on a multi-agent chemotherapy protocol. However, in kitty cats, there's really two categories. There are the responders. Those are the ones that go into complete remission. And those kitties can usually live a year or longer, which again is, a, you know, I know it's never long enough when it's your own cat, but just think about it because, you know, we're talking about a month without treatment and a month, you know, another month or two with just steroids. And they have a great quality of life during treatment and after. The non-responders, and usually we figure that out within the first month or two, so usually I tell people we're going to go week by week, see how they're going to do, um, so You usually those non-responders, they have a much shorter survival time and usually just a couple of months. So again, the big difference between the dogs and cats is that dogs have a much more consistent, reliable response, and cats are in these two categories, and the subset of kitties that don't respond just don't do as well, and those are ones I'm going to be you know, changing up their protocol or even stopping. But again, those cats that get chemo therapy, go into a complete remission, can actually do pretty well. Um, and again, you know, a year or longer with a, a good chemotherapy. So I keep saying good. What do I mean by that? So most of us are using a multi-agent chemotherapy protocol like the Wisconsin, um, University of Wisconsin protocol. It's about a six-month protocol in kitties weekly for about the first two and a half months and every other week after that. So again, they tolerate chemo very, very well. Um, and then owners are usually happy when we get to the every other week part of the protocol because they're not coming in as often. So that is um, pretty good there. Um, the one uh, sort of, you know, that's different is nasal lymphoma. So those kitties, in addition to chemotherapy, we're going to want to do radiation so we can really focalize their treatment to the nasal and sinus cavity um, and kill the cancer cells as well there. So usually for cats with nasal lymphoma, we'll do radiation in the beginning as we start chemotherapy. Depending on where you get your radiation, sometimes if you're doing stereotactic, it's going to be all in a week or so, or you might do weekly for like six weeks. So there's a couple different protocols out there. But in general, cats are going to do much better with chemotherapy than they are with steroids alone. Um, so that would be, um, you know, something to think about there. So comments are not refreshing. So let me just try this. Um, so um, Vicki, you came on late. Uh, you can definitely go back and... Um, you know, we talked about the different symptoms to look for, you know, and just kind of keep the theme of those kitties with nasal lymphoma. They're going to have different symptoms than the cats that have GI lymphoma, right? Because they have something going on in their nose. So they often have a runny nose, uh, discharge, you know, if your vet prescribes antibiotics and it doesn't get better after, you know, one course, that means that it's probably not an infection. And we want to think about that maybe there's something else. And it doesn't mean there's cancer in their nose. It could be rhinitis. It could be, you know, Know, something else. But again, you know, I see a lot of these cats with nasal lymphoma that were treated for a while on antibiotics and they're just not getting better, just not getting better. And then lo and behold, they actually have lymphoma and benefit from, you know, more aggressive therapy. So, 
Um, I think that's it for the different things. So again, you know, a cat's going to do better with not just steroids if we can add chemotherapy. There are some other chemotherapy protocols out there, but again, the CHOP multi-agent protocol is my first favorite. And then my second favorite in cats where the response rates are a little bit lower, but still pretty respectable is a COP protocol. And when we name these protocols, these are just, you know, each the COP, you know, COP, each of those stands for a drug in the protocol. Protocol. CHOP is the same protocol with the addition of doxorubicin. So, you know, again, usually we're describing it like that. Um, all right. So what other questions do we have here? Let's see. Caitlin, am I missing anything? Um, Yeah, so um, the other question that we had here was about um, prevention and feline leukemia positive. And so I kind of touched on that in the beginning, um, but I think it's, you know, worth driving home. One, we don't see as much FELV positive kitties, which is great um, because for lots of reasons, but um, FEL, cats that develop lymphoma um, that are feline leukemia positive um, have a much worse prognosis and they're 62 times more likely to develop lymphoma. And again, they're usually younger kitties. The GI kitties and the cats with nasal lymphoma that are feline leukemia negative are middle aged to older kitties, so 10, 12 years old. But cats that usually have the virus, that actually causes the cancer. So that's one of the times that we actually know the cause of cancer. Um, so, you know, it's, it's great to make sure that, you know, when you adopt your kitty, um, that we're getting them screened at an early age. So, you know, um, hopefully before you take them home, whether they have feline leukemia. So definitely important test to test for, um, FIV. So the feline immunodeficiency virus. So cats that are FIV positive are more likely to get lymphoma, but a lot lower risk. So only about five to six times more likely. If your cat has FIV and develops lymphoma, they don't do worse. And that's a big difference from cats that have the feline leukemia virus. So they're at risk for getting it, not as high as FELV, not as high as feline leukemia, but they can still respond and still do well um, even with treatment. The double whammy are the cats that have both the feline leukemia virus and the FIV virus. And those kitties are almost 80 times more likely to develop lymphoma and they typically don't do as well because they're feline leukemia positive. So that's an important thing. In terms of, you know, a lot of people want to know beforehand, is their cat going to do well with treatment or not? And so there are a few what we call prognostic factors that have been shown consistently in studies. And so we know that cats, and you hopefully gotten this by the end, so cats that are feline leukemia positive, um, they don't do as well. Cats that are sick at the time of diagnosis don't do well. So those cats that are really sick, losing weight, things like that, those kitties don't do as well. And then the other thing that's really predictive for, you know, long-term response are cats that get a multi-agent protocol, so not just steroids, and a good multi-agent protocol, and they go into complete remission. So that's not one that I can predict ahead of time, but usually, you know, we'll get them into complete remission within the first, you know, four or five weeks, and then that's usually a good sign for good long-term prognosis. Um, and again, those are the kitties that we're going to get out to the year anniversary and longer. Um, I have cats that are out three years, and you know, and then I have cats that, again, they're in that subset of crappy lymphomas, as I like to call them, that only um, live um, a couple of months. So I think we're rounding up the questions. We're about a half hour in. Um, and I'm going to just check in with Caitlin to see if we've missed anything. I do have some of the comments. Is anybody still there? If you are, just put something in the comment section. We'll see if I'm working here. Well, I'm working, but if my computer wants to seem to be working here. So um, if anybody's on and just wants to put a shout out in the section, that would be great. Um, and then let's see. Do, do, do. There we go. I finally got it. Um, we figured this out eventually. So if anybody's still here, um, hey, Michelle, I see you're there. Jenny was here. Um, Linda, Nicole, I think I finally got it right. So I see that there is a question from Linda about CBD oil and whether or not um, it helps in the treatment in a cat. 
So, I mean, it's a great question and I don't have the answer for you, Linda. So, you know, this is the cannabis oils. And so it's actually also a little bit tricky because of the regulations in some states in terms of doctors being able to um, prescribe some of these oils. So um, I actually have uh, very little experience using them. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, in, in people, they do use some of these for um, pediatric cancer to decrease anxiety and in stimulate appetite and actually for pain control. So um, I don't, again, I don't have a lot of experience with it. Um, you know, in terms of when it comes to treatment, I'm still going to go and, you know, recommend, um, you know, traditional chemo with steroids. I think that we're just early on in trying to figure out if the CBD oils will help. So, um, yeah, sorry, I can't give you more information on that. One thing you guys will learn about me if you continue to, um, you know, stay tuned for the different things is I will let you know when I know the answer and I don't BS. So if I don't know the answer, I will either go look it up or refer you to somebody who knows it better than I do. So again, I don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully we will learn more. Let's see. So now I finally, am, I feel bad. I finally have it working, everybody. So we can't leave. No, just kidding. Um, Denise, hey, Dr. Sue, can I talk about in our next live mast cell tumors and dogs? Yeah. So greetings from Puerto Rico. Hopefully the lights are back on there. Um, I have um, some friends and family there or some friends who have family there. Um, and we're always... Um, Yay! I'm sorry, I got distracted. So we're, we're wishing you all the best. So uh, Jojo's dad um, from Venice, Florida. So Jojo's the kitty I was talking about that is out seven years, right, Mr. Levine? So that is so exciting that you're here. So Jojo um, is the cat that I was telling you about that had lymphoma in the chest, flew it around the lungs. Um, I told them they wouldn't get through the first round of chemo. Um, and then when he relapsed the second time, we did more chemo and he's now out seven years. So uh, we miss you. We miss Jojo. And please post a picture maybe tomorrow um, on the page because I miss my Jojo. Um, he's a sweet orange boy who is just definitely a fighter. Um, Denise, I think mast cell tumors is a great topic. So if we don't do that in March, we'll definitely get that done by April because there's a ton of questions on that. And we might even have to do two, two part on that one. So I love that as an idea. Angel, um, hopefully I got a lot of your questions answered. They were great questions. So thanks for being here. Um, now that we're finally, um, working, Hey, Michelle, um, Again, guys, thanks for being patient with me with the, all the technical difficulties. Um, always a little bit frustrating, but I'm trying some new software, and I just seemed, haven't seemed to find found one that I'm super savvy with. But I got Caitlin by my side, so that's great. So, Elizabeth, you had another question about mast cell tumors. Um, so, you know, again, I think we'll, we're trying to keep this topic based so people can then come back afterwards and find them. So that will be, um, we have two votes for mast cell tumors on March 13th. Um, Caitlin did, if you scroll down and maybe she can put it one more time, a link to the next one so we can, um, we can hopefully get more people tuned in for that one as well. Um, and then Carrie Smith um, has a question. My six-year-old Siamese. So Siamese, uh, interestingly, Carrie, those are one of the breeds that um, are predis that we see more lymphoma in. So one of the few uh, pure breeds that we see it. Oh, the other thing, guys. So one of the things that we're doing, kind of themed along with each of our months, is I'm going to be posting little infographics. So we just posted two this week from cat lymphoma, and these will really be the highlights of you know what we're talking about here. And then they'll be in an album, you know, on this page. So you can kind of go and get all of the information on lymphoma. So, um, but that will be there. So back to your question. So I'm sorry about your eight, your 16 year old uh, Siamese kitty has lymphoma in the jejunum. So that's the most common site. So the small intestine. She's two years out from diagnosis. Woohoo! She did not tolerate the oral chlorambucil. Any other ideas to keep her comfortable than pred? So um, Carrie, if you're still there, did you? I'm going to guess that if your kitty was on chlorambucil, that we were talking about the small cell low grade form. Is that possible? Um, and so if it is, so usually the high grade forms, the more quickly developing one, the ones that the kitties are getting sicker, those are the ones that I was recommending the multi-agent chemo 
I did forget to mention that the cats that have the low-grade lymphoma, those are the kitties that we tend to treat with steroids, prednisolone, and chlorambicil, which is also called Leucaran, um, and they're usually on that chronically. And the average survival for those is about 18 months to two years. So um, I would guess, based on the use of chlorambicil, that your kitty, yep, had low-grade lymphoma. So you're saying that she has episodes of vomiting and constipation. So two things come to mind. One is we definitely want to make sure that the cancer is not causing the vomiting and the constipation. So, you know, that might mean another ultrasound because if it's the cancer, then you want to change the chemotherapy, obviously. If you and your veterinarian, your oncologist are sure that it's the leucaram um, and they're not tolerating that, um, in some of those kitties, I will use oral lomustine, which is usually, it's not going to be something you're going to be giving at home. Your vet will be giving it about once a month after checking blood work. So kitties usually get lomustine about every four to six weeks. And then sometimes the other thing to know, because you're at the time where this happens, is a lot of kitties with low-grade lymphoma, when they relapse, they actually become the aggressive form, the high-grade lymphoma. And this actually just happened with one of my coworkers' kitties. Um, it started out as low-grade lymphoma almost two and a half years ago, I think, and then poor Luigi just progressed to lymphoma of the liver um, and didn't do very well. So again, you know, not to scare you, but you know, what you want to think about is, is this that the low-grade lymphoma has come back and that's why we're seeing symptoms? Um, is it that the low-grade lymphoma has come back and transformed to the more aggressive one and you're going to need in one of those injectable chemotherapy protocols. Um, and then if it's truly just that he needs different therapy because he doesn't tolerate, and I keep calling him a him, but it's a she, um, that she's not tolerating the chlorambicil, I would try something like Lomustine to see if that works. So those would sort of be my recommendations. And guys, remember, like these are my recommendations, not being the primary doctor in charge of the case, just, you know, kind of giving you some ideas to go back to your veterinarian because obviously you can't make specific recommendations over the internet. But you guys know that. Um, and then Angel, can I briefly discuss the current protocols in combination um, or single agent for relapsing foma that are available. So Angel, it really kind of depends. So let's assume, so my favorite protocol for a cat with high grade lymphoma is gonna be, we talked about the CHOP chemotherapy protocol. Second best is gonna be COP, so the same protocol without doxorubicin. For kitties that relapse, um, I like a MOP protocol. I know everything's ridiculous with all these abbreviations, but that's a mustardin based protocol and that's, that's pretty toxic crap because that's the stuff that mustard and gas is made from. So the reason I bring that up is that's one that, you know, your vet should be, um, if you're, it's not one that a general practitioner should be doing unless they have a hood and all of those, um, all those extra safety precautions. Um, but I do like the MOP protocol. I think it's a great rescue protocol. And then Lomustine, which is an oral that, again, that once a month one, that would be what I would be thinking about for relapsing lymphoma. Um, you know, if it's a, a kidney one, those guys often relapse in the central nervous system, and then you're going to give a drug that gets into the central nervous system, something like Cytosar. So there's a lot of options. And so, you know, just because they relapse and, you know, Angel, I'm guessing you know this, doesn't mean that there aren't options, but you definitely want to get to an oncologist. And I always like to remember, hey, Lori, uh, welcome. Always like to remind everybody, you know, how do you find a cancer specialist? Um, you want to go to vetspecialist.com. Caitlin, if you could throw that into the comments, that would be great. You put in your zip code and they will tell you an oncologist in your area. If you don't have an oncologist in your area, because there are some parts of the country where there are not very close, um, you would want to go see a board certified internal medicine specialist and a good number of internal medicine specialists, especially if there's no oncologist in the area, they're usually pretty comfortable treating dog and cat lymphomas, um, you know, and they're often the ones that are making the, you know, working these cases up, doing those staging tests, remember those diagnostics that we talk about, and making the diagnosis. So again, if a cat's relapsing, not sure what to do, you know, I'm always, always recommending that oncologists get on board early, um, but at relapse would be another time. So vetspecialist.com would be great. Um, and that's with an S. So hopefully that helped. Yeah, so Carrie um, just said, um, I'm going to talk to her oncologist. Great about the Lomustine. And she is getting ultrasounds every three months. And so that's great. And just remember, sometimes you need biopsies. I hate in these guys that they've relapsed. And sometimes you're just going to need to change protocol. 
and see how they're doing. Um, but again, yeah, you know, I would try something else as long as you're convinced that the, ki the kitty is not out of remission. And again, the most important one, hey, Lisa, how are you, is if they um, have relapsed and they've gone high grade, they're going to usually need a more intense chemotherapy protocol, one of those injectable CHOP or COP chemotherapy protocols. Um, do, do, do. So there was a question. Did I get them all? I think I got it. Angel, I got your question. Michelle, I knew there. Hey, Michelle. Um, what is your take on the cancer fighting diets? Clients will ask raw base. Just curious on your recommendations. Huh, diet. Not that it's a bad topic. It's just, it's not an easy answer. So, um, you know, the idea behind the cancer fighting diets is that cancer cells are obligate anaerobes. What the heck does that mean? That means they require sugar glucose as their food source. And so, you know, and we want our cats, you know, more so than dogs, our cats, you know, they are carnivores, they need meat. Um, so we want them on low carb diets, but there are, you know, sugars and lots of carbs in these diets. But the idea behind these cancer fighting diets is that they are low in carbs and higher in fats and proteins. Um, the problem is there's just not a lot of, of science out there that shows that um, it's going to make a difference. But, you know, I think what's important is a high quality diet. I like for cats um, that have cancer to be on fish oils. We know that they have anti-inflammatory effects. Um, so I think getting them on, once, once they're on their chemo and settled, I like to get them on fish oils as well. Um, you know, the same thing with raw diet. Um, if they have not been on a raw diet, I do not recommend switching them onto a raw diet now. They're going onto chemo and they're immunocompromised potentially. And, you know, there could be contamination. With that said, there's contamination in some of the cooked commercial diets as well. So, but again, if they've been on a raw diet, I don't make them come off of it, but I would not recommend getting a raw diet um, started now, especially if they haven't been on it. So I think there's other things. And then, you know, the other thing is to consult with a nutritionist if your cat has special needs or other, um, you know, other, um, you know, other kidney disease or other things like that, it might be great to get a nutritionist on board. And I have a nutritionist up at Cornell that just phone consults with my clients if they want. Um, but again, you know, I just think it's more important that the cats are eating, they're eating a healthy diet. Um, and, um, you know, and again, like I said, most cats, you know, you just want to look at the ingredients on their, their food and make sure that it is a low carb diet. And that's going to be what cats need as well. So it looks like I'm a little glitchy over here. Hopefully people are still on. Um, so, all right, guys, I really, really appreciate everybody coming on and your patience. Um, I'm going to go give my boys a kiss goodnight and check on Matilda, who, if you were on in the beginning, I told you is recovering from uh, major knee surgery. She had TPLO surgery. Um, so I'm going to go give her her pain meds and give her evening walk. Um, and I'm super excited that you guys all took the time out from your evenings to join me. Um, again, thank you for your patience. Next Q and A is going to be March 13th and it looks like mast cell tumor might be a good topic. Um, we will do a poll, um, but I promise I will get mast cell tumor on in the next, uh, question and answer session or the other one. Thank you, Jenny, for the kisses for Matilda. So Jenny is one of my uh, close uh, friends. She's an awesome oncology technician, and she was sort of in the OR with me because I was snapping pictures. They let me in the OR. Crazy, right? But anyway, guys, I hope that you found this useful. If you did, give me a thumbs up. Um, you know, the other thing is share this. You know, you can tag a friend that you think that might be interested in this, and that will, you know, get other people to see it. Um, I did have a question from Kathleen. Uh, she wanted to know her friends on the other side of the pond um, wanted to know how they could watch it. So this will be available. You know, you can watch the replay. Uh, it'll be available, um, you know, on Facebook and we'll get it up on YouTube in a day or two because I find it a little bit easier to search there. So again, everybody, thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great night um, and we will see you guys all soon. Thanks again. Bye-bye.